When I went home last night, God's been, when I go home, he tells me what to do for the next night. And uh, he said tonight, teach on the glory. And uh, I said, sounds like a good subject to me. Hallelujah. I want to uh, quote something, of course, in Genesis. We won't turn there, but I'll just quote it to you, read it to you out of Genesis 18, verse 18. And it said that seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. In what way will he command them? That they will keep the way of the Lord. What is the way of the Lord? The covenant that he cuts with him. To do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath also has spoken of him. So I read that to say this. Dad Hagen as our spiritual father. He was faithful to train his children. And uh, we're endeavoring to be faithful to what he taught us. Yeah. Amen. Uh, by holding to it and passing it on. Yeah. I say that the truths and the life that came to us will not die with us. Yeah. Amen. 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 The warmer up a little. And uh, God said something to Dad Hagen. He said this. It would behoove you to study the Bible, every verse that refers to the glory. Well, if it would behoove Brother Hagen, it would behoove us. Yeah. Right? The word behoove means necessary or proper. It means it'd be worthwhile for personal profit or advantage. Yeah. Then listen to this definition of behoove. It is a duty. And a responsibility for someone to do something. So Dad Hagen talked about that when he would be in services and he would see the glory manifest, he would, te he would stop no matter what he was teaching on and teach on the glory. And uh, for us to move in something, we have to teach on it. Amen. For the church to become skillful in it. We have to be taught. We need to talk about it. So to have it in our services, we need to minister about it. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. A little too much bottom. It's booming. Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. And it reads, and he, Stephen, who was the first martyr, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, it affects your vision. It, it dictates where you're going to look. Now, what's he surrounded with? People seeking his murder. But because he was so full... He was not even focused on them. He wasn't focused on what was about to happen. And it says, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly. So being full will hold you steadfast. Amen. Looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of of God. Uh, I heard recently one, one fellow talk about, and he had the experience of going to heaven, and he saw Stephen. And he said to him, he said, we read about the awful martyrdom that happened with you. And Stephen said, I never felt it. I was full. And I was seeing something else, and I never felt it. Well, see, that's what Brother Copeland was preaching, that Jesus tasted death for every one of us. And when you're full, 
you move into the benefit of Jesus having tasted it for you so you don't taste it. And uh, it says he saw the glory of God. So we know this, there is a glory world. And sometimes that glory world is manifested in this world. And when it is, it's by a supernatural manifestation of the power of God. And whether you ever see the glory of God in manifestation in life, in this life, when you leave the earth, you're still going to go to the glory world. <laughs> That's where we're headed. And uh, I'll just, you can just note the reference, but Psalm 73 verse 24 says, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. So now he's talking about his leading on the earth for us. He guides us with his counsel. And afterward, receive me into glory. Um, we were down in Mexico. I forgot what year it was. Some of you went with us. And uh, Ed was preaching, and it was more so a minister's conference, as I, as I remember it. And while the service was going on, Grant had gone down there, and you're looking, and they had, you know, lighting uh, that was bright in the room. And uh, you're looking, and you're going, because I don't believe in conjuring up something. You don't ever want to do that because it opens you up to unsoundness. And can I say this and say it nicely? You don't want to uh, try to appear spiritual than you are. People who try to appear more spiritual than they are want to make you think they're more anointed than they are. You know, it's like, just be sincere. Just be genuine because God, God uh, will bless sincerity. And you want to be sound and you don't want to conjure up to try to make people think that you're in, you're in a realm that you're not in, you know. So I, my first thing is not necessarily doubt it, but I'm not going to just jump on and. So I'm looking, I go, well, it, maybe it's the lighting or something that it's starting to look hazy in here. And then it just got more and more. And then Grant said, do you see what I see? And then everybody's going, do you see what we see? And it got thicker and thicker and thicker. And I remember Sister Doris Wake going out and sitting down with the children afterwards and playing in it. It was like a cloud that I've never seen it to that degree. And Ed said he had never seen it to that. Everyone in the building saw it. Everyone in the building saw it. Were you there on that trip? You remember that? And you remember, uh, of course, I talked about uh, on Friday night how when Ed was ministering and the glory rolled out of the organ, Leslie, and Jesus stepped out of it. So what's that mean? That with glory, it can transmit him. Yeah. Yeah. To trans it is him. And uh, the glory of God comes into manifestation for a purpose, not just so we can say we saw something, not just so we can have an experience, but so it can accomplish something. So when that happens, it, as the song said, reach out and receive, take it, do something with that. And just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not moving and doesn't mean it's not present. I remember uh, God said to me uh, back in 2012, he said, I want you to have Brother Norval Hayes in your church. And it wasn't until a year later that he called me after Ed's home going and said he was going to be in the area. And so, uh, of, of course, we invited him. We wanted him to come. And the first service that he did, one of the gals here that serves in the Ministry of Help, she had to get up and go to the kitchen because she was serving in that capacity that night. And she came back into the room and she said the glory was all in the room. Now, no, none of us saw it, but she saw it. And when she saw it, God spoke to her and said, I'm blessing this congregation for honoring the man of God. 
Amen. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not present and blessing. Amen. Amen. Because, but that glory comes into manifestation for a purpose. Now, there is a fine line between fanaticism and reality. And many people get off into error because they seek to see something. They try to see something. But these experiences come as the Spirit wills, not as we will. And you, can't, you don't want to hear that someone else had it and go home and try to talk God into the notion of you having the same experience as someone else. Because in all reality, even if you never see anything, you know what Jesus said? Blessed is he that has not seen yet believes. So you're more blessed. I remember that that someone, there, there was a certain minister years ago who had had really prevalent in his ministry. He had visions and different things. And a, a certain person came up to him and said, you know, I've never had, a, had an experience like what you're talking about. And he said, then you're more blessed because you believe without having seen what I've seen. Amen. Amen. So don't try to conjure up that you're seeing something that you're not seeing. I mean, my husband would see Jesus, angels, glory, angels flying with messages and scrolls. And I heard about it on a regular basis. And there were so many manifestations he had that he never told me about. I remember, you know, and I, here I was married to him, but I never comped, I never uh, got this uh, idea that I have to equal him in what I see. Amen. I didn't have to kind of one-up him or act like, well, I'm as spiritual as you. Yeah, that's right. I saw. You know, I thought I felt a little breeze go by me. No, that's just one of the kids running by, you know. And I never tried to, you know, get that attitude that I had to equal him because I recognized that some of what much of what he saw was connected to his office and it's part of the equipment of his office and it, it was the way God chose to work with him that doesn't make us less spiritual amen and so I, I do remember one time in particular I was laying in bed one night and uh he was just laying there, and I said, you know, maybe I'm, you know, I'm a newbie at this. This was years ago. Uh, and I said, uh, I have the sense that someone is standing there, but every time I look, there's no one there. And he said, yeah, there's been an angel there for three weeks. <laughs> and I thought I was really, you know, stepping up into high cotton because I sensed. And it, he'd, he'd been seeing it for three weeks and never said a word about it, you know. <laughs> it can make you feel like you're a little pushed down, you know. <laughs> I remember the, he went to bed one night and uh, I would typically stay up much later than him and Stephen was young and Stephen was in bed and uh, <clears throat> the anointing fell on me. And I was the type that I loved to go get in my car and pray. For some reason, there was no phone, there was no television, there was no child, there's no anything in the car to distract. So I went and got in my car and just drove up because we were by a hillside and just drove up a hill area to pray. And uh, I was praying about, I knew I was praying about a house in California because we were still in Tulsa at the time and God had told us to move to California. And I knew I was praying about the house that God had for us, the provision of that. And um, so I, I came home then after that and went to bed. And about 4.30 or 5 in the morning, Ed was always up around that time. And he would get in the car and go down to the 7-Eleven and get a cup of coffee and a new, you know, get a USA Today, a newspaper. And he went down to get in the car. And uh, when he came running back up into the bedroom and woke me up and said, what did God say to you last night? And I mean, it's early for me. 
And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I know God talked to you last night. I went down to get in the car and the glory was still in the car. Because he knew I went to the car. So that's what I'm talking about. You live with somebody very perceptive like that. I didn't see the glory, but he knew it. But I never felt the need to try to equal by trying to appear that, oh, yeah, I see it. If I don't see it, I, that's okay. I just want the benefit of it. I just want the provision that's in it, the help in it. It's not about trying to appear uh, to see something just to impress myself or someone else. Amen. And so we have to be careful that will keep us safe in these places of manifestations. Amen. Uh, in Acts 10 and verse 9, I, I'll just tell you about it, how Peter went up to the housetop. To the, he just went up to the rooftop to pray. He didn't go up there to have a vision or have a trance. He just went up to talk to God. And while he was up there, uh, it was the will of the Lord that he fall into a trance and see a vision. But he did not go up to try to coerce God into showing him something dramatic. It just came as the Spirit wills. Amen. And, uh, you know, in other regions and, uh, and in other cults and stuff, they seek these things. But they, they, they go into these places without the accompaniment of the Holy Ghost, and that's where they get into demon power. We have the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we only go into these things with his accompaniment, at his lead. Amen, because that's when it's safe. Uh, so we don't, we don't just pray, oh, God, I want to see this. Oh, God, I want to see that. Just say, God, just whatever suits you suits me. Amen. Just learn to flow. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, turn with me if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And it says this, Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, are God's temple? Well, what's that? His sanctuary. And that God's Spirit has His permanent dwelling in you to be, a, to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. So he was saying, not just are you an individual, the temple of the Holy Ghost, the whole church, the whole, that whole local body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, God's sanctuary. Now, in the Old Testament, which is types and shadows, Solomon's temple is a type of this spiritual house, the body of believers. Amen. And the glory of God, the Holy Ghost, came in and filled Solomon's temple, which was a type of the body of Christ because we are the temple. Amen. So we can talk about individuals being filled with the Holy Ghost, and we should, but we also need to talk about the whole church being filled. Amen. Because that's filled with the glory of God because that's God's intent. Amen. Romans 6, 4, and I'll just read it to you. Romans 6, 4. Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. So the glory raised him. A manifestation of glory. When glory shows up, things start moving. When glory shows up, things don't stay the same. When the glory shows up, dead things live. When the glory shows up, broken things get fixed. Yes. Amen. It's in the glory. You get in the glory and you get what the glory works. Amen. Another translation of that verse says, uh, the King James, of course, says that he was raised up by the glory of the Father. And another translation says, by a manifestation of the glory of God. Amen. So the manifestations that happened in the temple in the Old Testament were manifestations of the glory, which is a manifestation of the Spirit. Yes. Now Romans 
8.11 says this, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. Well, it's the Spirit, a manifestation of the Spirit that raised up Jesus, and that's the same that's moving in us. Amen. Meaning this, we have more than enough in us to put us over. Amen. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit dwells in us collectively, and he wants to come into manifestation when we're together. Amen. Amen. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit manifests himself in different ways. He'll manifest through the gifts of the Spirit because we can call them manifestations of the Spirit. But the Holy Ghost manifests himself in other ways. Second Chronicles, and you can turn with me, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Second Chronicles chapter 5. In verse 13, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one. What's that mean? They're in unity. They're not out trying to outdo the guy sitting next to them. They're not trying to get a solo off here. They're not trying to do their own little riff. They're not trying to catch the eye of somebody. As the trumpeters and singers were as one, meaning they had one intent, one purpose. Their heart was the same. To make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying... For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not, could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. So there's something about being in unity. When we're singing, when we're praising... When we're worshiping, notice this, it brings God on the scene. There is power in united prayer and power in united praise. It would behoove us to have praise services to bring him into manifestation because then that power will meet the needs of the people without counseling them. Without having to talk to them privately and Amen. Nothing wrong with that. But why just take private counsel when you can have glory flow? Yes. Amen. So that they lifted up their voice and worshiped in that dedication of Solomon's temple. And it brought the glory into manifestation. The glory filled the temple. Ed spoke of seeing at different times. He would We'd be in a service and he would say there's a haze right over this congregation over or this section of the building or you know, or over the whole congregation and it would he would he he not I never heard him describe not to say it didn't because of course he never said all that he saw but I never heard him say that it came down over the people it was right above the people's heads and he would say if you want it reach up into it because it was up to the person to desire it. It would not be forced upon them, you know. Now, not to say that's always that way, but I'm just saying he would say it's right there. It's, you have access. It's available to you. Raise up your hand. Lay hold of what's in that. Well, see, that's an act of faith because the rest of us weren't seeing that. And if one is seeing it and telling you, you don't have to see it. That's right. You should believe the report of someone who's credible, if they're credible, if they're credible, that should be enough for you to release your faith. Amen. So why doesn't God cause everyone to see it? Because everyone doesn't need to see it. It would please him more if you don't see it and still respond. Amen. 
So he would talk about it being like a cloud or a fog hanging over the people, and sometimes it would vary in color a little bit. But not only did the glory of God manifest as a cloud, uh, he talked of it manifesting as a wind. That the glory can manifest as a wind. And the Bible talks about the Holy Ghost manifesting himself like a wind. What was it on the day of Pentecost? Yeah, that there came a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. One time uh, in particular, Ed was in a church. Uh, he had been invited to minister in for several days. And in the midweek service, um, the pastor was endeavoring to raise funds for a building. And Ed said by the unction of the Spirit, and you can't just say these things just because you're trying to flip a switch. But you have to say these things by the unction of the Spirit. And God said to him, those who give tonight, I'm going to bless them out of my treasury. Now, turn with me. You'll want to see this one. Psalm 135 and verse 7. Psalms 135 and verse 7. It says, he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. So God said to Ed that night, those who give in this offering, you tell them I'm going to bless them out of my treasury. And so he just said that. And he said that the Spirit of God said, I want $100,000 raised tonight. Now, it's wrong for a minister to stand up and tell you how much to give. But if the Spirit of God says there's 100 people in here to give $1,000, God's not saying you have to do it. He's not calling names, anyone who wants to. So it's not putting someone under the suggestion that you have to do it but God said by he said by the spirit God told me that there's a hundred people in here that can give a thousand dollars and when God said that to Ed Ed said I would rather not do it tonight let's wait till Sunday morning because there was only like about 150 people in the building and he wanted to wait till Sunday morning where there's more people because, you know, we need to help God with his calculations. <laughs> he wasn't aware of how many people were in the building that night and the ratio of those that would have $1,000. Aren't we just that human, you know? And so God said, no, tonight. And so Ed just told him what it, God said. And he said, just stand to your feet if you're going to give in that. And so people would stand. He'd go one. He'd, ca he'd count them as they stood up. And so he's counting and counting and counting. And uh, he gets up to 91, 92, 93, which is remarkable, yeah. right? 94, 95, 96, and about 96, you hear it on the recording. Shh, just like that. I mean, it just comes through on the recording. And if you hear that recording, and some of you have that, it will make that hair on the back of your head stand up, even the hair that left. <laughs> It was a manifestation of the glory of God manifesting not as a cloud, but as a wind. Amen. And within five minutes, they had $100,000 out of around 150 people that were able to give that night. So Dad Hagen made this statement. He said he was once in a service where the wind of the Holy Ghost came in. 
And when that wind passed, every person in the building was healed. He said one of them that was healed was a woman on a stretcher who had just gone through six surgeries, given up to die, said she looked like the picture of death, but once the wind passed through, she jumped off the stretcher and danced all around the church. We heard one minister had asked... uh, Dad Hagen said, what is it that you can attribute some of these manifestations to? And he said, the only thing I know is he said, when my wife and I got married, said we lived with her parents for a period of time. And he said, they had uh, some field area close by behind their home. And he said, I would go out into that area. And he said, "I I would take, 10 hours a day sometimes and just go out and pray in the spirit. And he said that happened, you know, he did that time after time after time. And he said, the only thing I know is that I got into the spirit and prayed some things out. And then when we got in services, those things came into manifestation that were prayed out. And he said one time in particular, he said he was preaching and, uh, he, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a large building, and it wasn't a lot of people in the building, but he said a wind blew through that wall. No windows, blew through the wall, blew across the people and went out that wall. And he said when it exited the building, every sinner was at the altar. They don't know how they got there. Every sinner was there, and every sick person was healed. The winds of God. Amen. How about in this era? Everything of past revivals in manifestation and more. Amen. Well, you say, how come we haven't seen these things? Well, maybe we just need to expect these things and be open to these things and be sober about these things and be safe with these things and not unbalanced in these things, but talk about it, teach about it. Amen. I remember, and in, in you probably would have too if you've read any of Maria Woodworth Eder's books, uh, you know, A Diary of Signs and Wonders that was really just basically her journal of, that she kept of, of her crusades. And she would fall into trances and she would stand, a trance would come up on her, and she'd stand for three days like this, mid-sentence, arm raised, finger pointed, and never blink, and never move for three days, and people would walk by, and they would form a line just that would parade by and see her. What was the purpose of that? A sign and a wonder. They knew no human could do that, and then when she came back, she just picked up right where she was and took off on that. And, uh, but the thing is, she taught on it. She preached on it because you have what you preach. And I'm not saying that you tr- preach these things to try to force them, but I'm saying if the Holy Spirit wills, then you have prepared the people. That the people are not shutting it down by deciding this is weird or... But God told me to preach along this line tonight, so whether you like it or not... We've got to recall and remember these things because God wants more of it and has more of it for us. And I'm not willing to just hear Dad Hagen's stories. Um, I want to say this nicely because I'm a nice person. It seemed like for me when I went through school, I was a year behind what the class I should have been in. Just because all my friends were a year older. And everybody else in my class, not to say they weren't nice, but I just didn't click with them. And I hung out with people a year older than me. And then when they graduated, I'm alone. With, I don't fit with the, you know what I'm saying? And it's almost, I don't want to feel that way in the body of Christ that I fit more with the generation that's already passed than the one I'm with right now. I don't want to feel like they graduated and I'm stuck here 
or just a handful of us stuck here, we need to, we need to be producing the caliber of spiritual leaders and men that were at the helm when we came into the Word of Faith revival. The Kenneth Hagans and the Lester Summer on the Oil Roberts and the T.L. Osborne and the Charles Capps and the Kenneth Copeland and the Jerry Savelle and all these precious men of God that were up there in the forefront. And um, I'm not willing to say, boy, wasn't that class great. That's not in my notes. That's just for venting's sake. I'm not willing that the most spiritual men have already changed addresses. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, I, want, I want for people coming up in generations behind us to be able to name a smorgasbord, a list a people that were generals, not because they were loud, but because they were skillful. Not because they were visible, but because they were skillful. And uh, as I heard one man say, in fact, David Oyedipo said this, he said, if your ministry does not far exceed your spiritual father, you fail. Praise the Lord. So we're going to have to work to get out of to stay out of failure mode, because Dad Hagen left a big example, and um, I, I dare to say we we have maybe some catching up to do and some things. Amen. And he talked about the glory, and he talked about these things, so that we would uh, reach for what the Holy Ghost wants to do. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Let's not forget about the glory. Let's not forget about that the glory can manifest in a cloud or in a wind or any whatever way he, the nine manifestations of the Spirit, whatever way he wants to. Amen. Because we believe we'll see it greater. And I'm not willing for the next generation to see more than we see in the sense of we didn't see all we could have or should have. Amen. So if we want that glory to, we want to set the atmosphere so the glory can come into manifestation. That's up to us. Too many times we're just sitting back and expecting God to just show up. But if we will set the atmosphere then if he wants to move that way, the atmosphere is prepared for him to move that way. And you know what it means to set the atmosphere, men. Hopefully you thought of that when you proposed to your wife. Hopefully that it mattered to you what the atmosphere was like. If you took her to McDonald's and bought her a hamburger, she should have said no. Because that's a sign of things to come. Because you're setting the atmosphere to show her how good her life can be if she says yes to you, supposedly, right? Right? <laughs> well, even so, uh, we want to set the atmosphere to let the Holy Spirit know your presence and movement it with us is important to us. We value how we approach the place where you meet your people. Amen. And it matters to us that we are setting the atmosphere so that you can do the Father's will in our midst. Amen. Now we have to go back and I'm going to say it. I know that some of us, of course, feed along Dad Hagen's line, but there, I, we have to keep repeating it because not everyone knows it or not everyone remembers it or some have let it slip and some haven't even heard it. And I'm talking about people that have, are even watching by live stream or some other avenue. Because I mean, just one night of these services, we had 16,000 people viewing through here. So see, it, just because we think we've heard it, there's a lot of people who need to know. Because God wants us all to come along into it, not just a few of us. He wants us all to come along. 
And we have to go back and remember 1987 before the camp meeting when Jesus appeared to Dad Hagen. It happened to him, but for us. Let's not lay down what happened for us. We need this. We need this. And G, uh, Dad Hagen recorded what Jesus said to him in the book, Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. You need to be pulling that out, minister, and reading that regularly. That is a word of the Lord for the day we live in. Amen. And one of the things that Jesus emphasized when he appeared to Dad Hagen that night and said this, clapping is neither praise nor worship. Clapping is applause. You shouldn't clap for God. You reverence him. We don't applaud him. We reverence him. And then Jesus said this to Dad Hagen, you've gone as far as you can go spiritually under the present circumstances. So we, this is why I'm wanting, and I believe the Holy Ghost is leading me to go this direction, is I don't want to go as far as I can go. I want... I want to get out of the get out of the way the things that are keeping us from going further. I know something. Listen, it's so easy to slip into some things. I remember uh, just months ago, I was sitting at home in the morning. I was sitting by my chair, you know, in a chair by the fireplace, and I was sitting down to just talk to the Lord and pray. And I began just worshiping the Lord. And uh, this came to me. If you really believed you were worshiping God, you would not be sitting in this chair. If you believed you were in his presence, you would not be sitting in this chair. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not wrong to sit in the chair. But there has to be personal times of, that we, we on purpose show reverence. Amen. I'm not talking about a religious way. Please don't misunderstand me. But we have to carry a reverence in our own individual lives. And that's what God was checking me on. You're not showing the reverence individually and personally in your private time. That you should. Well, I love the Lord. I, I want him to be blessed when I talk. I want to reverence him. But sometimes we can slip in what we call reverence and what he calls reverence. Well, I showed up. What's that? I mean, I'm at church, God. What's the big deal? The big deal is it matters how we behave and how we dress and how we look and how we act and how we conduct ourselves when we are in, a, in the temple unitedly together. It matters. And so God said to Dad, Jesus said to Dad Hagen, you've gone as far as you can go spiritually under the present circumstances. Tell my people to quit clapping and start praising. Then they will move up to a greater glory. So see, he didn't say then the Holy Ghost will do something. He said then they will move up. They will move up. We're waiting for God to do something. He's waiting for us to move up. Move up in our reverence, move up in our honor, move up in our skill, move up in our hunger, move up in our reach, move up in our faith, move up in our renewing of the mind, move up. And then Dad Hagen said this, the way we will move into God's greater glory is through reverencing the Lord. What's in greater glory? Greater miracles, body parts growing, arms growing, Legs growing, new organs, bodies straightening out, new backs, new organs, new everything that is needed. And wouldn't it be a shame to say that we get to heaven and say, your people in your congregation didn't receive for one reason. They didn't have enough reverence for the one they were dealing with. But here, that's what Dad Hagen said, the way we will move into God's greater glory is through reverencing the Lord. As we learn to reverence him, we must learn when to clap and when not to clap. Sometimes clapping is fine, sometimes. But when it is, when it is inappropriate, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And if we grieve the Holy Spirit, we can't move into greater glory. Therefore, it is vitally important that we learn to flow with the Holy Spirit and return to true praise and worship. 
Now, he's referring to clapping here. But can't we just say anything of the natural? Because clapping is just a natural thing that the body... How about coming in and worrying? Sitting there worried. and That's going to affect the atmosphere. That's going to affect some things. Amen? Just like clapping affects the atmosphere, someone's sitting there worried and not coming into unity. What You can see it on their face. They're harassed. They're distracted. See, remember, we are, we're collectively, collectively to be filled, a temple to be filled. So it matters that we come in and recognize the way I come in is going to determine how far everyone else gets to go. If I come in and I've, You've been, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, displeased with a spouse when I walk in the building. That's going to affect the service. No matter what the pastor preaches, no matter what anointing is there, it matters how we approach him. This is what it's, it's about approach. It's about approach. So yes, Jesus absolutely was singling out this one thing of clapping, but we have to realize it's representative of natural things that can hold us in the natural instead of moving into a place of the Spirit and reverencing the Lord. Amen. Can we really worry and be reverent at the same time? Right? So he said, Therefore, it is vitally important that we learn to flow with the Holy Spirit, that we remain true to praise and worship. How many people are really worshiping and praising when they're worried? Because their attention can be so absorbed on what they're going through that their hands are raised, but their hearts aren't engaged because they are so preoccupied. And these are reasons why uh, we don't go further into some things is because we have to discipline ourselves and we have to, we have to make sure that we bring our supply to that service. Amen. When we learn to praise God the right way. Now, this is what Dad Hagen said. When we learn to praise God the right way, we will experience a deeper move of the Holy Spirit in our midst. He's saying this, the Holy Ghost will show up and manifest himself. And if he's not, we have to ask, are we doing all we could or we should do and could do to set the atmosphere? Amen. And then, of course, we know Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas were thrown in prison. And we know this passage in verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, they prayed and they sang praises unto God. It's important to notice that Paul and Silas gave equal time to prayer and praise. Amen. They'd already offered up their prayer to God, but their answer came when they praised. What were they doing? They were setting the atmosphere for the Holy Ghost to manifest in their behalf because they needed a manifestation. And they realized the manifestation would not be initiated by by God, but it would be initiated by the atmosphere they set. Now, did you get that? The moving of the Spirit will be initiated by the atmosphere that we set for Him. Most people do a lot of praying, but how much praising do they do? We're always asking God to do something. And of course, that's scriptural, but when we spend equal time fellowshipping with the Lord and we spend time praising and singing praises to Him, we're going to see some mighty manifestations of power in our lives because He set a precedence for it through Paul and Silas. He showed us that He would do that. Amen. Praising God creates an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to work in. We need Him to work when we're faced with situations. And it's up to us to set that atmosphere through praising is one way we do that, the primary way we do that. We miss out many times on God's blessings for one reason. We don't take the time to get in the attitude of worship and praise. We just do this, worship and praise, worship and praise you, praise you. And there's no attitude with There's no heart connected to it. Dad Hagen made this statement. He said, before I pray, I take time to get in the spirit. Because he said, I need to get in the spirit to have my my prayers answered. Amen. Hallelujah. Because there's a close relationship between ministering to the Lord and receiving from the Lord. These two go together. When we need to receive, we must minister to the one who is 
uh, the help and the answer for our lives. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The, uh, Psalms 22 and verse 3 says, But thou, God, art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So we could say this, God inhabits the praises of his people, right? But if there's no praises, he can't inhabit. When people are facing something in their home and they're worried about it and talking about it, God can't inhabit to bless them until praise starts. So in your home, you can, don't just wait for church in your home. You can start praising in the face of bills that look to be unpaid. Start praising and you're giving God something to inhabit. Now, if someone inhabits something, they live there. You understand that? So when God, he inhabits, he lives in that praise. Amen. Meaning this, he comes on the scene. He manifests. Hallelujah. I mean, I understand this in the new covenant because people will say, well, that's an old covenant uh, scripture. Yes, it is an old covenant scripture that he inhabits the praises of his people. And you say, well, the thing is, on the new covenant, he inhabits his people. Yes, you're right. But he still inhabits the praises. <laughs> he didn't leave the praises just because he came in us. Amen. Hallelujah. So as we set the atmosphere praising, we can set the atmosphere for manifestations of the glory that if the Holy Ghost wants to move that way, we're unitedly all there. We're ready. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, when, when uh, Jesus told Dad Hagen, tell the people not to clap. You can clap along with the music to keep a beat, but that's a different purpose. We understand that, but God told us what to do with our hands. And it's not to ring them in worry, amen, that we're to lift up holy hands without doubt or wrath or, wrath or doubting, amen? amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we're saying this, we have so much to do about... We have so much to do with whether or not the Holy Ghost and how he's going to manifest by how we set and approach the atmosphere for him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, I'll read it to you. Know you not that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And, and the Amplified again says this. Do you not discern and understand that the whole church at Corinth are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and as an individual. So you see God's spirit dwells in the body of believers and that's where he'll manifest himself. Amen. Ministering to the Lord with a body of believers creates opportunities. Creates opportunities for the gifts of the spirit. I love something Kenyon used to say that he would say. Before he walked out to minister, he would say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to go out and deliver God's word. This is your opportunity. This is, I'm giving you the opportunity you seek to bless the people, to minister to the people. So let me go out and give you your opportunities. That's really all the Holy Ghost needs is an opportunity, and he will take us up on it. Why? Because he desires to move and bless and manifest the Father's plan and will in our midst. That's, that's why he's here, Amen. to bring to pass the will of God. And if we go to church worried and if we go to church troubled, we rob the Holy Ghost of the opportunity that belongs to him and why we're coming together. We're not coming together, and you know this, and people who have been part of this church, know there's one thing you will not do is come to my church and promote your business. That's not the opportunity that this building was built for. There's another opportunity. It is God's opportunity to meet the lives, the needs of people. And I won't have somebody using it for their own personal gain. You go, if you allow those kinds of things in a, in a church, 
you will have no miracles, you will have no healings because you took the opportunity for yourself instead of giving the Holy Ghost a place of opportunity. The local church is to be where the Holy Ghost dwells, but it's his place of opportunity. That every service we say, we're gonna give God an opportunity to meet the needs of people, set people free today. And so I love what Kenyon said, I'm going to go out and deliver God's word. Holy Spirit, this is your opportunity. Amen. He needs opportunities. Amen. And it's people who are skillful with the things of the word and the spirit that are going to be able to provide the opportunities the most for him. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me to your feet. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and turn our hearts toward him and worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we lift up our voice with one accord. And we say, you are God. You are the creator. You are the one who made the world and all that is in it. You are good and your mercy endures forever. And you manifest yourself among men. So we invite you, come and manifest yourself anytime in our midst. We are your building. We are your house. We are your temple. And we say, come and fill your temple. Fill this body of believers with your glory. Fill this temple with your glory. Fill this house with your glory. For the body of believers, we are your house. And we praise you tonight. And we give you, as we lift up our praises, we offer you a place of habitation to move in our praises. We do our part. We reverence you. We honor you. We glorify you. We are hungry for you to have your way. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Lift up your hands and lift up your voice. Tell him. I know that there, there are people who come here with needs and we don't make light of that. We don't belittle that, but we say this. Right now, let's focus on Him. Let's minister to Him. We worship you, Father. We glorify you. We glorify you.
like if you would come and just stand right there. Just stand right there. Uh, turn more toward me. Back up. Right, right there. Right there. Just lift up your hands and receive what God has for you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. I thank you, Father, for supernatural provision, supernatural supply, complete and total provision that comes to him in remarkable ways, in ways that bypass the natural and normal processes. We thank you, Father. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Father. We glorify. Now receive of that. Hallelujah. There it goes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor Bracken, come right about there. There comes a fresh anointing right there. Right there. There comes a fresh anointing upon you. A fresh anointing that you'll now begin to step into things he spoke to you about years ago. It's time for those things. It's really just the beginning. You, you've seen a little bit here and there, but not the beginning of the measure. This is the beginning of the measure that you've seen in the past, the degree. We thank you for it, Father. There it goes. Hallelujah. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you, we thank you. Mashtikiki ya da posto ya de best kikiki e. Mandaria da posto korea da best kikiki e. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you. We thank you for it. We thank you for it, Father. Pastor Craig, come stand right here. Right there. Come up a, no, a little, uh, about six inches more, right? Right there. We thank you, Father. Because God is going to move in very, very, not only supernatural, but spectacular ways of favor to position people around you so that all the supply for the building, all the supply for the next phases. It will be remarkable to those who look on and say, it just seems like, ah, things just come so easily to him. Well, it's the favor of God that people use their influence, their position, their ability in your behalf. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. Mashtikikikie. Mashtikikie de bishtikikie. We thank you for it, Father. 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 Pastor Kotov, if you could come stand right here. God says to me, you're going back another way. Uh, stepping up into the next, the next phase, the next room within the office you operate in. And in this, the voice gets so large. The voice gets large. And in the spirit realm, larger. That things will move at the command of your voice when the Spirit tells you to speak something and you speak it, and things I'm talking about in your nation, it will bless your nation. It'll be a rescue, a rescue, a rescue, a rescue. The words of heaven, a rescue in your nation. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it. It father mashtikiki e de besimenini mishini ham pachata pakastikiki e mantaka ya de bosto koko e de beshinkiki e mashata pakakaye e city 
Esseti kiki kia te peshi kiki yei. Mashtakar yata peshi kiki Pastor Dave Watrous, come out here if you would. Praise the Lord. Just stand right there. We thank you, Father. There comes on you a refreshing, a refreshing that will propel you forward and accelerate, not just the building that was accelerated to you, but the fruit, the progress in ministry, acceleration, refreshing to accelerate. We thank you, Father. 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 Ah, there it went. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pastor Bill Matthews, come here if you would. Right here. Right there. Yeah. Up, up, about, right there. Perfect. Um, you're coming into a room, and this room holds clarity. Now it holds understanding. Don't bring preconceived thoughts to this room. Let what's in the room dictate the thoughts. Don't decide something has got to be this way. I'm going to do it this way. It's going to be carried out this way because in this room, God has stopped his thinking, his mind for your future and what he has for you. So lay down everything that of how you imagined it would happen or how you thought things would come to pass and let him clearly define that for you, clearly articulate that. And if I could say this, I, I want to say it the way Dad Hagen said it. He said he would, so to speak, lay out on the altar everything that was in him. Everything of what he was doing, every motive, every intent, every thought, every intention, every plan. He would lay it all out before God. And he would say, anything that isn't of you, I don't want it. Or anything that is of you, you can pick it back up and hold to it. So I would say it to you this way, lay out everything, everything that you thought about how things would be, how the ministry would be fulfilled, how your office would be carried out, the things that were contained in that for you. Just lay it all out before God and say, Father, you can remove it or you can give it back. It doesn't matter to me. And he will put back into your hands and say, no, that way is right. Or that thinking is right, hold to that. But so that you can receive the new thoughts that he has for you. Don't hold anything till he tells you to hold to it. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you. There it goes. There it goes. Hallelujah. We thank you for that light, Father. Thank God for the light. Thank God for the light. Thank God for the light. Pastor Sonny, come up here if you would. Right here. Up at just right, right there. Uh, it's so critical, and not to say you're not doing this, but I want to articulate by the Spirit the joy and the ease of what He's called you to will be entered into by praying in the Holy Spirit. 
so that you pray everything out and then you walk it out because you prayed it out. Take extra time to make sure you're praying out every facet in the Holy Ghost. And then when you do that, it's already, it's already uh, plain for you. And then you walk down that path easily. If you don't, things will be a struggle when they're not intended to be a struggle. Things will be more difficult, they'll be more labored, they'll be prolonged. And I know you do this, but I'm just saying it's so imperative. At certain times of ministry, it's especially imperative because sometimes coming into new phases, new transitions, new things. So take time to do that. And as you do that, uh, it will be the joy it's intended to be and the ease that it's intended to be. And don't, don't be concerned that things don't look to be in place because... Uh, too many times we think we have to have this in place before this, before this other can happen. That's not true. Uh, God can bless us when nothing is there. So don't, don't look and say, well, there's not much there. Don't, don't be concerned about that. Amen. Because God's abundance works in the face of nothing. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for that. We thank you for that clarity. We thank you for the utterances, for the fullness of your plan to come to pass. We thank you for it. Ah, there it goes. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Masatapakakaye. Masatatatakoye. Mostokoye de Beshti Kikiye. Mashtaka. Pastor Dan Bolt, come here if you would. Mashtakaye. Stand just right there. Mashtakaye has Dikiye. The greatest, one of the greatest things we get to enjoy in this life is the help of the Holy Spirit. So look to Him to tell you what to fill your mouth with regarding every situation. Because sometimes what we can do, we can grab hold of something, a scripture, a passage, and say, I'm holding to this. But what really works, what really bears the fruit, and what really hits the target is when we say, Holy Spirit, what passage do you tell me to hold to? So if I could say this, not letting go of your faith, not backing down, but saying, before I set my faith, Holy Spirit, I'm going to be very sensitive to what you tell me to, to latch that faith onto. Amen. Because otherwise we can wear ourselves down and get tired by, we see the truth of something, but it's not the truth that the Spirit is highlighting for us. Does that make sense to you? I know that, for example, when I was going through a particular test, I would get up every day and I was... I needed, I needed a word from the Lord for that day. And I didn't just get in the Bible and find a word I liked because there's so much in it I like. I looked to the Holy Spirit to direct me. And then I would, okay, I'd hold to that. And then the next day I'd get up and try to go back to that word and it was like, that word doesn't fit today. It's all the truth, but it doesn't fit. I've seen so many people and I say this really for warning for all of us because it's easy to become this way because when we know what the word says about something, sometimes we grab hold of a word and we just become adamant about it. But being adamant does not mean faith. And I've seen people adamantly 
go into failure because they didn't take time to, what was the Spirit telling you to believe for? And when that happens, you'll be refreshed in the believing. So I encourage you in that, that you have divine help in that. Father, we thank you for the refreshing, the help, the mind of the Spirit. <laughs> ah, for every single arena, for the church, for the ministry, for the home, for the family, for every single arena. We thank you for the mind of the Spirit. And Holy Spirit, thank you so much for the direction you give us. It, it always, if we'll stay with it, it always brings us to complete victory. And we thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Mastakaye. Mastikiki other bastoya shikiki. Hamamashtikiki. Hamashtikiye. Mostokoria de bishtikiki. Mastakaya de Bishtikiki. That's interesting. I, uh, Pastor, Pastor Anderson, if you would come right here. I, I looked over there and I had this almost like right there is fine. Uh, I almost had this thing to where it, it looked like you were, if your knees were like this, like if you were carrying something heavy. And I said, God, what is that? I mean, that's the way it looked because I know you're not carrying something heavy. And he said, uh, this, is, this is what what he brought to me. Have you ever seen someone that they know that they're fixing to come into uh, in the presence of someone they have great admiration for? And it's almost like they weren't invited in and you just kind of, but you got to go in the room where they're at and you don't want them to see that and you just kind of come in like this, you know, and you want to slip out because you don't want to disturb them. You have such great respect for them. You don't want to draw, take away from them. And he said the reverence he walks in. And that's what I saw this. It was, it was a, a posture of reverence. He said the reverence he walks in toward my word and toward my spirit positions him for great glory and for a voice that will go far we thank you father we thank you father we thank you father we thank you father <laughs> because i saw it just like you weren't just bent knee and standing there you were doing this <laughs> it was a walk of reverence a walk of reverence that it would behoove us to take a lesson from that, to take instruction from that. Amen. You know, when you're, a, uh, when you're the head of a ministry, a business, anything, when you have an employee that shows proper approach and respect, you deal with them. You keep your eye on them in a little bit different way than people who are just flippant and don't seem to have any idea they just don't get it they just don't get it you really in the world most people just don't get it in all honesty in in some things in pastoring and in ministry we've had conversations about different people trying to help and you just say they just don't get it I, I, I gave instruction, I gave, I told them exactly, and they didn't get it. They just don't get it. They just don't get it. And I'm just saying, if you'll listen to what the Spirit of God said to him, you're gonna, you'll get something with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because when you walk with respect and reverence, uh, you get, you get special notice from heaven. He notices. He notices. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The two of you, just step forward right to there. 
We thank you, Father. We thank you. Ha ha ha. Much sticky yay. Uh, time has been lost. Things have gotten behind. But he is so masterful at helping make up for lost time. So know this. Although time lost, nothing of the plan is lost. Nothing of the plan is lost. So uh, you're doing well to position yourself so that you can be positioned for acceleration. It is not time for acceleration. It is time for revisiting foundation and fortifying and even adding to enlarging that foundation. But just don't ever feel like don't ever fall into the wrong thinking that because of lost time, something is lost. Nothing of the plan is lost. But it will require an all-out effort. It means it's, you're going to have to set aside some of the ways you approached some things and let the Holy Ghost redefine some of that for you. I'm talking about the way you prayed, the way you believed, the way all these things, let him touch into all those things and readdress some of the things in your foundation. And he'll take you back to some of the very basics, how safe that is, how wonderful that is. All of us have to revisit that, but he's gonna emphasize that because some of the things that at one time uh, you thought, I got a pretty good handle on that. To go as far as you were going, yes. You did have a good handle on it for that degree, but there's something greater he has in mind for you to go to, and that degree won't be enough. So he's going to go back and readdress so that you can add more stories onto the foundation. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you, and it will be a joyous time. It will be such a precious time of revelation increase. What a delightful, what a delightful Yes, some of it looks like preparation again. That's okay. That's okay. Because preparation will always arrive you at success. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the fullness. We thank you for the fullness. We thank you for the fullness of your plan. Bringing them into the fullness, the fullness of your plan. So set aside things that are not going to help you in your race. Spend your day and uh, spend, just make sure if this is not going to help me in my spiritual walk, I'm not going to give the time to it that I was once okay with giving the time to. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mashtikiki. Ah, Regina, come up here, love, Simon. Come up here, Ramos, rather. Come up here. Uh, right there, right there. Uh, he's going to touch your hearing. Because where y'all are headed, you're going to need to hear some things for the supply and the place that you bring to where y'all are headed. He's going to show you exactly what to do. You're going to hear. I know. Just do this. I know it looks like it's not going to work, but I hear. Do this and it'll be okay. I know it looks like things are not enough. I know it looks like things are not. It's right. No, no, no. I, I, he's, already, he's already told me. I know exactly what to do. I know exactly what to do. And none of what I see moves me because I've already heard. I have already heard. We thank you, Father. There it goes for that increased hearing. We thank you for that sensitivity. We thank you. We thank you, Father. We thank you. Ah. We thank you for it, Father. Ah. We thank you for it, Father. Mashtikikiye. Anjadabokokoye. 
and I mean, you will notice a remarkable difference. It was, it's like things that would have weighed on you, I mean, absolutely, they just, they cannot find a landing pad. They just can't land on you. They don't trouble you. You can look at the business of that, the numbers of that all day long and walk away and be completely unaffected because you're graced for it. We thank you for it. When you hear, it's so, it's such a joy to just walk it out. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. Let's just thank him. Let's thank him. Now remember what we said. Uh, the nine manifestations are a manifestation of the Spirit. Just like, uh, amen. Hallelujah. And we honor that. We don't treat it lightly. I said we don't treat it lightly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mama, <sighs> Mama. Now, Pastor Jay, come here. It's right there. I hear. I hear this. Uh, it's so strategic for God to have you with the project of your home because it's to give you further training and skill for other projects. So don't see any of it as having been a waste or an intrusion. It was intrusion. It was preparation. So. You might need to go back to some of the things, and if I could say this, draw a little bit more of skill, the, the things you've walked through with this project. Go back and even revisit. Pay attention to his leadings, because all of those things were really uh, tools in your bag. So that when future projects come, you've already, you already know how to use that tool. You've already recognized nothing of that project was an intrusion. Nothing. It, it was the plan of God. Therefore, it is not merely a natural project. Yes, it shows up in the natural, blesses you with nat in natural ways, but it was, it was authored by heaven. Therefore, it's not a subtraction. None of it has been an intrusion or subtraction. So some of it needs to go back and restudy some of the ways you saw him lead you and move and work in your behalf to, uh, to become, get a good handle on that tool. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. You know, I, I remember years ago, um, when I just started pastoring, I would go just do the things in my daily life. I'm going into a store and buying something, and the Holy Spirit would say, don't buy that. And I, I didn't understand, why? It's not a big deal. How important is this item in the scope of life? I didn't understand why God was interested in that had the money for it. It wasn't like I was going to be putting something in jeopardy financially to do that. And then later it dawned on me. He was using the unimportant to train me for the important. So if it's for training, it's no longer unimportant. If it's for training, it's no longer unimportant. And so sometimes if we're not careful, we can see natural things that God is working and moving in and we can treat him as less than if he's involved it no it now got elevated that action got elevated i mean you might have just been going out to buy a couch and the, you had a leading do or don't towards this amen it's not about a couch he elevated it's it's about what he was trying to teach you of how to know him and following his leading it's no longer a couch it is your preparation Amen. And so we shouldn't diminish it by saying, well, this isn't spiritual enough. 
Does that make sense? Because it's just natural things I'm doing. Listen, I mean, uh, you, you heard me talk about, uh, I, I got uh, a precious family in the church. They offer me a new dog. Now don't, don't go offering me dogs. <laughs> but they offer me a dog, and they didn't know that I, I had been talking to God about a particular something I wanted. I had two dogs, you know, but there was just a few more conversations I had with God about something, and they offered me one. And I, and I thought, well, I had never thought of that breed before. But when I looked at it, I go, oh, my goodness, that kind of fulfills the things I had talked to God about. And, but I said to God, I said, no, God, I said, you know, I don't need responsibilities that I don't need. But I said, you know, it, if it would be a blessing and I had, and, you know, then I'll do it. Because you know this, adding a dog is almost like adding a child at, in some ways to the family. Because it's more to look after. And when you travel, I'm really just adding a dog for Stephanie to look after. But... <laughs> But anyway, I'm just, I just know this, that in the time that we're coming in, I just want to pay attention. I don't want to add something that's going to be a distraction. And so I had peace about it, you know. I'm not, I'm not talking about being over, overly spiritual and weird. I'm just saying have your spiritual antenna up. Don't get weird, you know, that you won't do anything unless you hear a voice or, you know, you know, unless something spectacular happens. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying it, it needs to matter to you that you just run it by them. You know, just hold up your antenna. And uh, so I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look, look at that. And that seems right to me. And so I said, yeah, I'm going to come out and I'm going to look and consider going that way. So the night before I go, I'm telling you tangibly fear. Fear. Just anxiety over just why. Because the devil wants to make you second guess yourself in the small things. If he can get you guess, second guessing yourself in the small things, he'll rip you apart on the big ones. He wants you to lose confidence in your ability to follow your own heart. And so he, if I could say, I mean, I could feel tangibly, you better not, you better not. And then I turned and I said, Father, what do you say? He said, he'll, it'll be a blessing to you. So now I know why the anxiety and fear came because blessing was coming. And he was trying to abort blessing. And you say, just over a dog, it's not over a dog. It's over being skillful about hearing and following because uh, since it's the little foxes that spoil the vine, uh, God wants you especially skillful toward the little things. Amen. Then I was telling Morgan because they got one too, and I said, let me tell you something. If God is interested in blessing you with, a, with that pet, because they have two. It's not like they needed another one in the sense of they don't have a dog. They had to. But I said, if God is blessing you down to the dog in your home, then it's a reminder every time that dog walks in the room, if he'll take care of me and provide me with a dog, how much more the bigger things, the mortgage, the insurance, that that dog is no longer just a pet. It is a moving, roaming preacher in the house reminding me that whenever the temptation to get worried about this house comes, I look and say, wait a minute, if God took care of the details down to the dog, he takes care of every other thing in my house. Amen? So we don't, we, we have to not be, we have to be careful that we don't see natural things as an intrusion because sometimes they are the places God's training us on for spiritual success. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if, it, if you know something, if God said that dog will be a blessing to you, it's no longer unimportant in my life because God said something about that dog. Amen. Anything God gets involved in on, I'm going to treat it right. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember I said something to God uh, regarding uh, Sister Amy's castle and, you know, and just planning and looking ahead financially at what you may need and things. And I said to God, I said, is it really wise for me to take all of my money that I have and put it toward a house? 
is that really wise? I mean, that's the third house I have. Is it really wise for me to do that? I've got two others, you know. And I'm, play, I'm pleased to have him. Listen, if he wants to give me more, I'll take more than that. You say, why do you need it? Just because I can, if he says. If he says. But I, I said, is it wise for me to take the money and just spend it on the house? I mean, this is just something natural, you know. Do I need to save it for something regarding ministry? And this is what God said to me. He said, the money is for the plan and the house is the plan. So see, we're treating it like something natural, but if it's part of his plan, it's no longer just something natural. It is in the natural, but it's not just something natural. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you tonight. We're reaching. We're hungry for more of your movement to bless the lives of the people. Father, they're going, the harvest is great. There's going to be such a harvest coming in of people who need your glory. And Father, we are hungry for it. We're reaching for it. That we position ourselves that the glory of God has an opportunity. The Holy Ghost has every opportunity to bless the people that come into our congregations. And we purpose, Father, to allow you to have your way. And so we do our part. We live a life of reverence. We live a spiritual life. We choose. We live a consecrated life, separated unto you. Because how we conduct ourselves determines how far you can minister through us to others. We thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mashtakaya, just lift up your hands. Mashtakaya, the boy at the bestie. Mochoko the bekiki, anabasta da 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 koye. Machoka tapoko de kiki. Mastakakayana matakaye. Asta ta 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 ye. Mastakoye. Macha ta 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 koye. Now, I don't know if this is it. This is for a minister. I don't know if you're in the room. I don't know if you're watching by live stream. I don't know if you're watching on some other avenue. But you have all, you have determined within yourself, I'm going to quit. I'm quitting the ministry. I'm tired of what I've gone through. I'm tired. I'm quitting the ministry. I love God, but I, I'm just, I'm quitting the ministry. I'm, I'm just, I'm done. I'm done. And I'm just telling you this. If you're here. Or if you're watching, don't you do it. Don't you do it. It is a trap of the enemy that will bring such heartache, such difficulty, and such brokenness in your life that uh, it will be the greatest regret of your life. So I say this, and I warn you by the Spirit, don't treat the call of God lightly and think that you can dismiss it whenever things don't feel right. I'm just saying the heartache, the heartache, the heartache on the other end of that decision will be overwhelming. It will be so far reaching. You have no idea the devastation of it. And no devil can make you quit. You can't blame the devil. No devil can make you quit. The decision is yours. The choice is yours. It is not his. Hold to your choice. Hold to your choice. It is your choice. And I'm just saying, uh, you, your thinking is, if I get out of the ministry, things will go easier. You get out of the ministry and things will be harder than you ever dreamed. Not because God will do anything. The devil will just have a heyday in your life. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, for helping us. Father, we pray for that one. We lift them up, that they be strengthened with might in their inner man, that you bring them into the light, you bring them into the knowledge that they need. That you, they come into the understanding that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And it's wrong thinking and an unrenewed mind that has worked against them. 
because they thought being called meant that they were that they were developed and mature. There's more maturing to happen. There's more development to happen. So give yourself that time. Take that time to develop and mature. The calling is no substitute for spiritual development. You have to mature, you have to grow. Be patient with yourself as you do that. But you've had this idea, you've thought wrong, you've thought being called meant that you were completely prepared. And you're not. The call doesn't prepare you, it just identifies what to prepare for. Hallelujah. So don't be discouraged, be encouraged. Amen. Hallelujah. But it's just like this. It's like there's a, there's a bridge out ahead and the Holy Ghost is waving frantically. Don't go this way. Get off the road. Get off this road. Because it's not a road to play with. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the, thank you for the help. Thank you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ha, 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 ha. Your spouse has been pressuring you. Get out of the ministry. Get out of the ministry. Get out of the ministry. And they've made it difficult for you in the home. Don't you follow that. Don't you follow that. Don't you follow that. Don't you bow to that. They don't have the mind of God on that. They are talking out of their flesh, out of their emotions, and out of their feelings. Do not succumb to that pressure from that person. Hallelujah. And they're saying, if you loved me, you would do this. You love God first. You love God first. And God will take care of everything else if you love Him first and foremost. Don't you fall into that manipulation. That spouse is manipulating you. And uh, thank God for the help of this. To make it clear and spoke, clear spoken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you will re-consecrate, recommit, consecrate yourself afresh to Him, I guarantee you He will run to meet you in the refreshing of that. Amen. And, Amen. and give yourself to be prepared and trained and fed and fortified. Hallelujah. And you say, well, what if my spouse makes good on the threat and leaves. Let them. Let them. Let them. You can do without people. You can never do without God. But they won't. It's a bluff. It's a manipulation. But I mean, you have to be so firm that I don't, I don't leave the plan of God for anybody. I don't care who you are. That has to be your consecration. I don't leave the plan of God for anybody. And I don't show my love for people by leaving the plan of God. I don't show myself a good parent by leaving the plan of God. I don't stay home and not do what God told me to do just so my children will, will love me and be happy with me. No, I obey God. Amen. My, that's what we taught our children. I mean, Ed was gone much of the time. But the thing is, we taught him, your life is blessed because he obeys God. Your life isn't subtracted from. You're not missing out on something because he obeys God. Your life is blessed because he's obeying God. The more he goes, the more blessed this family is. The more he does what God told him to do, the more blessed this family is. Amen. Hallelujah. Being a preacher's kid is not hard. It's a blessing. Being in the ministry is not hard. It's a blessing. Listen, think about the hardness that comes to people in other professions. The devil will try to paint it that ministry is hard. Let me tell you, ministry is not hard. Ignorance is hard. Not knowing what we ought to know and is hard, but it's always a blessing to obey what God has. Amen. His will is my home. His will is where I fit. I don't fit anywhere else. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we lift that one up. We lift them up. We lift them up. There may be even more than one. 
We lift them up tonight. Turn, turn. We thank you for the turnaround, Father. We thank you for the turnaround. Ah, Oh, we thank you for it, Father. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want the children of ministers, if you're here, the children of ministers, come up here. The children of ministers, come up here. Praise the Lord. Just line up right along this step, if you would. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to have Stephen and Morgan, you go and you minister to them if you would. Hallelujah. Thank you for the greatness of your plan. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence, your movement in this service tonight. We're so grateful. We're hungry for more. And we purpose to do our part so that you have every opportunity to bless the people and to fulfill and bring to pass the plan and the will of the Father. We give you thanks for it. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Turn around to somebody before you're dismissed and say, I'm expecting the glory of God. And you can be dismissed. God bless you.